Today on LA Currents, it's the newest nationally celebrated holiday. But Juneteenth is more than that. It's a moment that shaped our history and continues to influence our society today. Next, it's time to go swimming. If you're ready to beat that summer heat, LA public pools are free and open for fun. First, we chat with the Budget and Finance Chair for the City of Los Angeles, Paul Krikorian. We get the inside scoop about the impact and the spending plans of LA's new budget. Well, what can you do with $11.2 billion? Actually, someone is here who knows exactly what we're going to be doing with $11.2 billion in the city of Los Angeles. I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Krikorian. He is the chair of the City Council and Budget and Finance Committee. So nice to have you here, and so nice to have you here uh, in better circumstances. Indeed. <laughs> last we chatted, it was rather uh, a different arena completely, because last year, uh, was truly a fire drill for the city of Los Angeles. How did we do in regards to the budget and the income and everything we needed to survive? Well, this is the 10th year that I've led the budget through the city council as budget and finance chair, and I've never seen anything like this. Um, when COVID hit, um, we were in the process of preparing the budget for this year. Right. And so all of a sudden the rug was pulled out from us. All of the revenue projections that we'd counted on were um, completely wrong because the economy had collapsed and with the collapse of the economy goes all of the city's revenues. Sales tax, temporary occupancy tax, the business tax, all of the, the things that are based on the activities of our economy just fell off the cliff. It was a desperately difficult time uh, to get through this budget year. Did we as a city learn to not rely on something in particular? I hope that we learned uh, that we need to be prepared for the worst uh, and that means building up and having a strong reserve in our budget so that when difficult economic times do hit we have that large rainy day fund, if you will, that we can fall back on without deep cuts in services. Uh, so that's the first thing, and I'm very pleased to say that in the time that I've been budget chair, we have built up the strongest reserve that the city has ever had. So when COVID hit, we uh, did have a reserve fund that we could count on, and that is what allowed us to survive the year. The American Rescue Plan. A part of this budget does in fact have additional monies from the feds. That is some, that's a one-time gift to the city to help with this recovery. So how much is that and, and how does that play in? So a couple of things that you said that are important there. It is one time. One time. And people need to remember this when they hear these big numbers. And it was $1.3 billion and that was payable to the city in two tranches in two over the course of two budget years so the first half of it we got in this budget year and that was used for revenue replacement that was that really just got us back up to even after okay. we had lost so much in terms of revenues so for the year that starts July 1st that additional 660 or so million dollars uh, will be used um, to restore our reserve, as I said, and also for significant one-time investments that are really going to be necessary to uplift neighborhoods and people who've suffered so badly during this COVID time as well. There are as many answers to homelessness as there are people who are experiencing homelessness. This budget invests an enormous amount uh, in permanent housing, 5,600 new units of permanent supportive housing, as well as uh, bridge housing and temporary shelter, uh, cabin communities investing uh, in Project Home Key and other things to get people into a transitional situation before they move on to more permanent housing. There's also money in this budget to increase uh, affordability of affordable housing as well. You 
as one of your fiscal priorities. It was an amortization study regarding phasing out gas and oil drilling in the city. That sounds very optimistic. How does it work out and how are you feeling and what does that actually do for the city? Well, um, this is a transformative time uh, for the city of Los Angeles on the environment. Uh, I was one of the leaders that initiated the LA 100 process and because of that we're now on the road to DWP becoming the largest municipal utility in the nation to be entirely on carbon free energy and that uh, we're We've got a blueprint in place to do that. We'll be achieving that goal. Um, in addition, we uh, are going to be phasing out all oil and gas production in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and in order to do that, we need this amortization study, which will um, determine how long the uh, producers of oil and gas have to close their existing wells down. And once they recapture their investment, then we can shut them down without imposing additional burdens on the taxpayers of Los Angeles. So that's why the amortization study is, is important. It will allow us literally to shut down oil and gas production throughout the city of Los Angeles, which was a goal that I think no one thought was really achievable even just a few years ago. Uh, and now it's within reach. Um, we're also investing a lot in this budget in our urban canopy, increasing tree trimming and yeah. new tree planting. Um, we're spending money on uh, developing wildlife corridors and having personnel and planning who will be responsible for that. Um, and this budget also includes some of that one-time investment that we talked about earlier will be directed towards uh, renewable energy um, uh, generation, including uh, solar energy at uh, parks and on parking structures and, and so forth. So we're doing a lot of investment in the infrastructure that's necessary to generate that renewable energy. What about just basic infrastructure? I mean, that's one of President Biden's big things, you know, just you know, streets and sidewalks and, you know, all the things that we need to just have on a daily basis to survive. And that's really what cities are all about. You bet. I mean, first about public safety, second about basic services like, uh, like you're describing. And so this budget includes a street surfacing for 1,700 lane miles uh, throughout the city, which is enormous. 1,700. 1,700. So... Uh, halfway across the country, uh, that, that would be the equivalent of, of those lane miles. And uh, when you think about it, that's about five miles of resurfacing every single day. We're continuing to invest tens of millions of dollars in sidewalks, it's around 40 million this year. Um, and very importantly in both of those areas, streets and sidewalks, we're tying those repairs to our targeted local hire program. So uh, the targeted local hire program uh, reaches out to people who are some of the hardest to hire people in Los Angeles. People who have barriers that get in the way of their being, being employed. Maybe they've been uh, formerly incarcerated. Maybe they're experiencing homelessness or recently did. Uh, maybe they have um, other, they're coming out of uh, foster care and they don't have the basic skills necessary to go out and look for a job. Targeted local hire programs give, gives people who apply the soft skills that they need to be competitive job seekers. And then if they succeed in that initial program, we channel them right into civil service positions for the city of Los Angeles. So they get not only a job, but a life-changing career that will impact generations of their family. It's a phenomenally successful program. So, you know, people who a year ago might have been sleeping on a sidewalk, next year may be fixing those sidewalks. Well, it's great to see you. Um, I'm glad things feel a little bit more back on stable ground than last time we met. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you again about all of these uh, incredible programs and 
a good year for the city of Los Angeles. It's going to be a good year and many more good years to come, I'm confident. Thanks right. for having me. Thank you, Council Member. Anita Bennett examines the legacy of Juneteenth through the eyes of three council members who reflect on their own community space, principles, and values. Many black Americans consider June 19th or Juneteenth to be Independence Day. That's the day that the last enslaved people in this country were freed, but the celebration was bittersweet because they learned about their freedom over two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Joining us to talk about Juneteenth in the city of Los Angeles are City Councilman Curran Price, Marquise Harris Dawson, and Mark Ridley Thomas. Thank you so much for being here. Delighted to be yeah. here. Yeah. So Juneteenth seems to be growing in popularity in the city of Los Angeles. Why do you think that is? The unrest uh, related to the social justice and, and equity uh, has permeated down and certainly there's a greater awareness now of, of Juneteenth, greater appreciation of its historical significance and a great appreciation for the need to celebrate it. I think what you see over time is the story of black people in this city more and more becoming central to the overall uh, narrative about uh, what Los Angeles and Southern California is. The black community helped build this community, it helped make it the creative capital of the world and so our story is one that's on the front page. Given the fact that uh, Los Angeles is one of the largest population centers for African Americans, it is very difficult to imagine uh, that there wouldn't be celebrations and many of them to pay attention to and to pay homage to the high points and the low points of the African-American sojourn in the United States of America. That's what it's about, I think. And how do you communicate the importance of the day, Councilman Price? I'm happy to report that uh, activities that are going to be taking place in Lambert Park, uh, really symbolic of, uh, of the black community throughout uh, Southern California, and appreciate the moment in time that we're in uh, and the significance of it uh, moving forward. And I would go out on a limb and say it's not just about celebrating, but also raising awareness, correct? Telling that story is important uh, throughout our history, but especially now, because it's always important to have reminders of where we can go. We celebrate, but effectively people stayed in slavery two years after the time slavery had ended, after America had fought its bloodiest war, uh, where it lost more people than it's ever lost in any war, to end slavery. People stayed in slavery for two years more um, uh, because the message didn't make it there. Part of the lore is that the messenger that was sent by the federal government to Texas got killed on the way. Well, that just happened January 6th, where we were trying to certify an election. And so I think it's important to keep these stories front and center as a reminder for how far we can fall if we are not vigilant. mentioned the protests over the summer and they raised so much awareness about redlining, um, you know, black people being prevented from obtaining generational wealth. Uh, we just had the Tulsa, the anniversary of the Tulsa race massacre. So um, Juneteenth, is this, is it going to become even more conscious now, do you think? Well, I think it's up to us to push it to the fore. I mean, here in Southern California, we have Bruce's Beach. I mean, for all the talk about so, about Tulsa, we have it right here in our own backyard. Um, and there's more. Make no mistake about it. People have been pushing for generations and will continue to push. For those who don't know, a black family who lived in the Manhattan Beach area, they owned property, and 100 years ago that property was seized simply because they're black. What is happening with that? The idea is that folks should be made whole. Like, it's not actually very complicated. <laughs> folks should be made whole and nothing short of that. It's the most forceful example of what reparations constitutes. This will not go away, and not only will it not go away, it will bring attention to similar such instances in other parts of the nation. There was uh, government complicity in the denial 
of their rights. What I learned is that this family was denied generational wealth and exactly. it's happened to oh, exactly. African Americans yeah, right. in this nation Absolutely. for so long. And what that means is that this family would be extremely wealthy right now, right. but they're not because their property was seized. Right. So are we gonna see more instances, hopefully, of people well, being made whole? So this is a place where people literally lost their, their, their land. But there's also the issue of redlining. All of our families, and I can say this without even knowing the histories, all of our families, when we came here, we had housing on the east side of South LA. That area was redlined. So the property appreciated at a slower rate than everything else around it. So our families walk away when it's time for me to go to college or you to buy a house or whatever, our families have less to give because of something that was imposed upon their neighborhood. And so we've got a long way to go for people to be truly made whole. I think those are, those are the, the examples uh, that are more concrete and more objective, but they're much, much broader than that and affect almost anybody who's African American in, in our society. It's just, it's, this issue of intergenerational wealth is fundamentally important because it has contributed to the impoverishment of communities across the length and breadth of the nation. Uh, and I think this is a concrete illustration of that. Uh, but the issue of predatory lending and redlining and the like that uh, we have worked on for many years, you mentioned Lamert Park. Uh, Lamert Park was defined by restrictive covenants, and it was only after Shelley versus Kramer uh, went to uh, the United States Supreme Court uh, that we had those racially defined areas stricken. Lamert Park, it wasn't until 1957 that the first black family moved in Lamert right. Park. Right. The legacy of slavery, Juneteenth, the legacy of slavery uh, is real in our very lives and that's the point that we cannot lose sight of. And racism because we just marked what happened in Tulsa. Mm. Tulsa's dramatic. It was a, it, it was a military action uh, by that city and its citizens and that state against those particular people in a particular place over a set number of days. But then there is the pedestrian racism, the everyday every racism. Day. Right. Every day, every day, you wake up, you go to sleep, it's always there, it's a part of your life and you live and die with it. That's uh, what we have to get and that affects us all. There, there isn't anybody that gets the free pass on that. Um, you know, I might not have lived in Tulsa when the bombs were dropped, but my family lived somewhere and wherever we lived, Redlining was happening, mm. predatory lending was mm -hmm. happening, mm -hmm. banking yeah. discrimination was happening, the, the denial of insurance was happening. All those things are happening on a day-to-day -day day -day basis and we've got a long way to go to correct those things. And so reparations is not just about you know, paying for those sins, those wrongs, but really compensating for, for, for what happened in the past and how we can move forward with it. That's right. And that's, that really is a challenge. Right. And so right. this, this notion of reparations is, is alive, it's real. Uh, and increasingly, I think we're going to see uh, uh, levels of government taking specific actions to attempt to address the wrongs that were done. It may have implications for universal income and a whole range of things that's relevant. And uh, we know that there's leadership on the city council by uh, Councilman Curran Price on that issue. And, and both uh, Harris Dawson and I were pleased to join in helping on that. But that's a big ticket item. Can you expand a little bit on universal income? Uh, over a thousand families will be benefited with a thousand dollars a month for a year, no strings attached. Uh, we've seen experiments uh, in other parts of the country, in other parts of, in fact, in our state, uh, Stockton, uh, most recently, uh, demonstrated how these kinds of programs can really be helpful and, and help turn the tide. Who are the people benefiting from this and how, how do we find them? So there'll be a lottery. But there's going to be a process by which people will be able to apply uh, to be selected in this, in this program. And so we're excited about the prospects of having the largest such experiment here in Los Angeles. It's not a new idea. You know, Martin Luther King That's right. uh, mm -hmm. That's talked right. about that, yeah, right. uh, you know, in the, no, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. right. So mm -hmm. as, as a part, as, as one answer to that. Poor People's Campaign. Poor People's Campaign. Poor People's campaign. March on Washington. We're still having these conversations. That's right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, That's we are right. out of time. This has been a lively discussion on Juneteenth and race in America and Los Angeles. Thank you so much.
Next, we sit down with aquatic pool manager Monique Schwanemann. She offers some pretty useful tips about lessons, training, and social interaction at LA Public Pools. Well, whether you like to dip or dive or splash or swim, the city of Los Angeles has lots of wonderful pools for you to enjoy this summer. And to tell us all about it, what you can and can't do, and how you can enjoy summer in the city, I'm delighted to be joined today by Monique Schwanemann. She is the Aquatic Facilities Manager. Let's start with the very basics. How does somebody get to come to one of the community pools? Absolutely. Well, you can go ahead and find which pools are open by visiting our website at swimla.org. Once you find that out, come on in make sure that you have a swimsuit so it has to be the swimsuit material and of course um, if you need to have a full cover-up for religious reasons or personal reasons that is totally fine um, as long as it's that swimsuit material so make sure you bring that we don't allow flotation devices of your own and a lifeguard's favorite rule always walk so please don't come running in here <laughs> we will tell you otherwise um, and yeah we, we have recreational swim lap swimming for adults uh, lessons for kids and adults it's a lot of fun what are some of the first things as a lifeguard you want people to realize when it comes to being safe in the water the first thing is communication with your party. Whoever you're swimming with, you never want to swim alone. You always want to swim with a buddy or a group. And then talk to each other and don't be afraid about telling them what your limitations are. If you can only swim in the shallow end, that is totally fine. Just be open about that with the person that you're swimming with. Once you set those boundaries um, and let them know what your swimming level is, again, enter the water safely wherever you are. And it's also really important that if you're not entering the water yet, that your pool stays locked up, especially if you have a fence around it. No child should ever be left alone at a pool by themselves. Something that we do at our LA City pools is we do a swim assessment oh. um, to gauge what level they're at for our swim lessons, but we also do a swim test before anyone goes into the deep end. So someone would have to do two laps there and back of freestyle or crawl strokes. Basically, that just means that their hands are fully coming out of the water after they pull. And then once the lifeguard sees that, they are good to go and into the deep water. But if they're not ready for that yet, then they should stay in the shallow. I want to talk about the swim lessons, but I want to keep on this safety topic for just a second mm -hmm. because I know when my daughter was little and we would go to, whether it be a friend's house or a community pool or something, you, know, you never necessarily knew who was in charge. So we came up with this thing where it may look silly, but it sure made us feel better. We would say, you know, I'm the watcher. And we would acknowledge that. And we'd trade off, but we'd say, I'm the watcher. Perfect, yes, you're the water watcher. That is excellent. My family does that. I have a lot of cousins. So um, my aunts and uncles and my parents would trade off and do that as well. So making sure that um, you have a sober, alert adult that is watching over the kids, um, that is a great idea. And to be able to switch off, that, that's wonderful. Yeah, because you never want that idea where, I thought you were watching them. No, I thought you were watching them. You know, That's a terrible thing to think about. Right. But all the opportunities that are available in this, you know, wonderful environment. It's very tempting. I'm surprised they didn't let us actually do this in the water today. But having said that, what are some of the things that the LA City Pools offer? You mentioned swim lessons. Absolutely. Swim lessons for kids and for adults as well. So kids starting at the ages of seven are allowed to get into the water and take swim lessons on their own. Oh, wow. Is there actually an, an age in which it's too early to help? I mean, maybe not here at the LA Pools, but too early to learn to swim? Yeah, um, I think it's important to get kids comfortable with the water as soon as you can, even if it's just, you know, kicking or blowing bubbles in the bathtub, because the more comfortable they are in a water environment, the easier their swim lesson is going to be. So what about adult? What about some of the adult opportunities that are available at the LA City Pools? Right, so we do have lap swimming and then we also have lessons for adults. We have beginners, we have intermediates, and then we have other fun classes like aqua size, which are our aqua aerobics classes. And when it comes to the benefits of swimming, you know, you're a lifelong swimmer. I mean, you started swimming when you were what? I was actually in high school. I've loved the water since I was born, but I'm officially training in high school, actually. Okay, so what are the what are the benefits of, you know, besides the fact it's beautiful, it's fun, what are some of the health things you can think about? There are so many benefits for swimming. Um, you're not gonna have those, you know, negative effects on your joints that maybe you might feel on your knees with running or with, um, 
things like push-ups or anything like that. Working out is, is great all around, but the pool is therapeutic. You could do it at any level. Um, you can get a good workout in, and it's, it's good for people of all ages and people of all abilities as well. What are some kind of games that you can play in the water that allow you know a family to enjoy the pool uh, or you know get some exercise without even calling it exercise what are some of the fun things that would really enhance someone's experience at the pool um well, a favorite of our swim team members and our classes is sharks and minnows. So <laughs> I love it already. <laughs> yes. So basically, you could, depending on how big your party is, you can have one shark, you could have two sharks. Basically, it's tag in the water. Okay. So um, they're gonna go. You're gonna try and start on one side and get to the other side without somebody, without getting tagged by the shark. If you get tagged by the shark, then you are now the shark, and there are more sharks and minnows until you only have one minnow left, which is the winner. <laughs> A very brave little minnow to yes. see with all those sharks. And what about, do we still do Marco Polo? Is that still a, a thing? Do Marco, kids even know that anymore? I know Marco Polo. Okay. Um, I definitely hear about it. It's only tricky in a public pool because your eyes are closed and you might run into people and some people might not like that as much, but it's definitely still a game that's fun and that we, and that we see a lot. You just brought up an excellent point. Because we're in a community environment and it's a community pool, I mean, you really, this is not your private property. This isn't belong, this belongs to everybody. So what are some of the courtesy things that one should consider when they come to a pool? I imagine not spreading their stuff out all over the place and I imagine yeah. being a little bit more uh, conscientious in the water. So what are some of the things that you want people to consider when they're coming down to the pool? Maybe they have a lot of kids, maybe they have no kids, maybe they're elderly, maybe they're young. What are some of the things that you would hope people would consider? Yeah, so um, at most of our LA City pools, we have a white line that goes around the perimeter of the pool, or here you can see that we have the drains that go around. So we actually ask that people keep all of their personal belongings behind that line, okay. or in, if not in the locker rooms, just to keep that space so people have space to walk um, on the deck and get into the water safely. Um, and then, yeah, respecting people's space in the water. Of course, kids are gonna splash, absolutely. It's a pool, everyone wants to have fun. Um, but you know, you don't need to take up the whole the whole pool or the whole shallow end. So just being kind and courteous to other people. You may bump into someone, of course, but just be nice about it. And just you know, we're all here to have a good time. Are some pools have areas sort of separated, designated, so that you know little guys can't pass this? Line of buoys and that kind of thing. Absolutely, all of our pools do. So all of our pools will have a safety line when we're open to the public that differentiates the shallow water from the semi-deep and then the deep water. We're sitting in the sun here, yes. um, but people should also be conscientious when they're coming to a pool to think about skin safety. Absolutely. We see it so many times where kids are so excited and they slap on that sunscreen and they jump right in that water and it immediately comes off, right? So it's really important that you apply sunscreen, that you apply it well before you get in the water, maybe t uh, 15 minutes before you get in the water is a safe rule. Um, and then if you get out of the water um, for a period of time, we'll go ahead and reapply, dry off, reapply before you get back in the water. And are we still worried about when we eat and get in the water? Well, there is no food or drink allowed on our decks. There you go. So it's not really a problem. Go ahead and eat outside, let your stomach settle, and then um, you're free to come in. Okay, so that's a good point. What can you bring and what shouldn't you bring? No you food. No food. Um, you can bring water, nothing glass. So you can't have like a glass container of water. It has to be in a plastic container. Um, a, a towel. Uh, we don't provide towels, so you do bring your own. Sunscreen, definitely, and then a bathing suit. So it can't be the shorts that you were wearing all day or um, a regular t-shirt. If you want something to cover up, it has to be a rash guard. Um, just that, that standard swimsuit material. And also for women's swimsuits, they can't necessarily be the thing you may or may not see on the cover of a Sports Illustrated. Right, again, this is a community pool, so we want to be respectful to everyone and um, wear something that you're comfortable, you know, jumping in the water with or swimming in. Well, it was fun. I can't wait to see you out on the water and hopefully we get to talk again soon. Yes, thank right. you. Thanks. And that's a wrap on this LA Current.